The question that we're looking at, of course, is how to begin the Christian life or how to become a Christian. How to know if you were to die that your sins are forgiven. There are many people in this world that just do not know that. They wonder. And I would say if you ask most people in this world if they were to die, if they would know they were going to heaven, most of them would say, I think so or I hope so. The problem with that, of course, is you do not want to wait until after you're dead to find out if you're saved. The Bible is very clear in 1 John 5, 13, that these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to think. You don't have to hope. The Bible says you can know it. And God doesn't say that flippantly. He wants us to know. He doesn't want us to have this entire eternity with a flip of a dice or a gamble. He wants us to know for sure that we're saved. God wants us to be saved more than we want to be saved. This begins 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ died on the cross and I can know for sure that God loves me. How do I know that he loves me? The Bible made it very clear that God loves me. It says, but God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we, we were yet sinners. How do I know he loves me? John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish. Now I can say that I love you so much that I would be willing to give you my golf clubs. I said that to you before. That may mean that I love you. It may mean that I hate my golf clubs. It just depends on, uh, on the perspective there. But I could say I love you so much I'll be willing to give you my life. You would say that's the greatest love anyone could show is be willing to give their life. I don't think that's the greatest love. As much as it is a great amount of love to give your own life, I think it's a greater amount of love for a person to say, I'm be willing to give you my own son's life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I would much rather die than have my son have to die. But God gave his only begotten son's life that whoever believes in him would not perish. Now tonight we're going to be taking a little bit of a refresher course. I do understand that you all know the gospel very well. But the Bible does say, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. So the Bible says that this should be set apart in your heart. You should know it so well, no matter what man would come, no matter what question is asked, you would be ready. So this takes some study. I want you to look at this passage here in Psalm 145, verse 11. And I want you to consider just what it says to you as a Christian tonight. Because I know that we're talking to the choir tonight, those that have known Christ for a long time, and they know for sure that they're saved. I would say everyone in this room knows that they're saved, that their sins are forgiven. But Psalm chapter 145, in verse 11, it says this. Start reading in verse 10. All thy works shall praise thee, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of thy glory, of thy kingdom, and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. The saints will do that. The saints desire to do that. They want to make known God's glory to other people. They want to talk about his majesty. They want to talk about his incredible power. Why do we want to tell people about that? Because of all that he did for us. How much power and might and majesty he revealed to me not only in saving me, but being with me every day of my life and helping me day by day. And that's our purpose. Our purpose to, is to make known a God like our God with the glory that our God possesses deserves and demands to have that glory to be spread around to his creation. That they would understand how great of a God created this world. Now the problem, and we're going to look at seven principles tonight. I know there's a lot of ways to give the gospel, a lot of ways to share it. A lot of you know the Romans wrote. A lot of you know a plan of salvation based upon John 3.16, Romans 3.23. But I want to start with this plan. This is a seven points. It's in the back of your bulletin every week. I think it's a very, very clear way of explaining the gospel so that people can really understand it. The first point is, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
Now you can maybe see that. There's two people hanging from the Empire State Building by a 10 link chain. Now you can't see the chain, but they're hanging from the top of the Empire State Building. And I'm telling you, that's maybe 106 stories above the ground, and they're just hanging there. Now, if they are hanging from the top of the Empire State Building with a 10 link chain, the 10 links represent the Ten Commandments. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't care if you've broken just one of the links or you've broken all ten of the links. It doesn't matter. If you were up on this Empire State Building next to a man and he broke all ten links and you only broke one link, I'm sure you're a lot better off than he is, right? Which of you will fall further? Which of you will fall faster? Which of you will fall harder? It doesn't matter. You're both going to hit the ground about the same time if the links break at the same time. And you will be very, very much having great company going down and talking about what this is going to feel like when you hit. But when you hit, it's going to be all over. The Bible says all have sinned, and that includes every pastor, it includes every dad, every mom, every child on this earth. We've all sinned. That's the problem. The second part of the problem is the wages of sin is death. The wages or the payment for sin is death. And you'll notice in this verse that it's not the wages of sins, plural, but the wages of sin, singular, is death. The illustration of this, the best illustration, is Adam in the garden. As you know, Adam in the garden was told by God that you can eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden, but of the fruit in the midst of the garden, you shall not eat of it. He says, in the day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, as you remember, Eve took that fruit. She gave it to Adam, and Adam did eat. And the Bible says that the eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Now, the problem is, again, it's just a small sin. If you sin against your neighbor, that may not be a great problem. We all sin against our neighbors. We all sin all the time. But the problem is you're sinning against God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin by definition is not what you do to your neighbor. Sin by definition is what you do against God and what separates you from God. And the problem with Adam and this little sin, and I, I mentioned to you many times, but if we were to take that sin and bring it to a court of law and the judge were to say, what did he do? Well, he ate the fruit of a tree. The judge will throw that out. It's such a small, small crime in America, but it was such a huge crime in the history of mankind because it plunged the entire world into death. All of us die primarily because of sin, but also because of Adam's sin. When Adam sinned, it plunged the entire human race into depravity and death. The wages of sin singular is death, and because of that, Adam died. He's not living today. Eve died. She's not living today. And every person on this earth will die because of sin. Principle number three is heaven is a perfect place. Now this is a huge situation. It's found in Revelation chapter 21, 27. Very important verse. Revelation 21, 27 is right at the very end of the Bible. It's talking about what the new heaven is like. And when it talks about this new heaven, it's talking about the gates that will not be, be shut at all. There will be no night there. The glory and honor of the kingdom, will, nations will be in this, this city, this new heaven. And he says in verse 27, And there shall in no wise enter into it, the new heaven, anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination, or makes a lie. Now you and I may not understand what works abomination. We may not understand what defileth. Have you ever defiled? Have you ever worked abomination? I don't know if I've worked abomination. Probably. Defiled? Probably. But I do know this. I know I've made a lie. And the problem is, every single person in this room has also made a lie. I got a kick out of this. George Phillips, a true story. From Meridian, Mississippi, George Phillips. He was going to sleep at night and his... <laughs> And his wife said, honey, you left the lights on in the shed. So he looked out. Sure enough, the lights were on in the shed. So of course, he had to get dressed. And he went out the back door, opened the door, and he noticed, wait a second, there are people in the shed. 
and they're taking stuff out of the shed and they're putting it in a pickup truck. So he ran back inside real quick and he called the police. The police answered and he said, hey, there's someone in our shed. He's broken, they're broken our shed and they're, they're stealing things out of it. And they said, well, are, in, are they in your house? And they said, he said, no, they're not in our house. He says, well, all the patrols are busy right now, so you go back to sleep or go back in your house, lock the door, and when the police are ready, they will come to your house. So the guy calls to 30, and he calls back to the police, and he says, this is a man I just called a little bit ago and told you there were men in the shed. You don't have to worry about coming. I shot them all. <laughs> They're all dead. Within five minutes, three patrol cars, an ambulance, <laughs> an armored uh, police vehicle pulled up to his door, and of course they caught the thieves red-handed. And they came up to the man and said, I thought you said you shot them. And he said, I thought you said you were busy. <laughs> Evidently not that busy. <laughs> the Bible says that heaven is a perfect place, and you cannot enter heaven with one lie. Now, here's the problem. You look at this beautiful, beautiful place called heaven, and every person on this earth has told a lie. Everyone. You have lied, I've lied. And if heaven is a perfect place and not one light can enter into heaven, that means there's not one person on this earth who's going to be in heaven. If we leave it where we're at right now, at principle number three, there's not one person in this entire room or in the entire world that's going to enter into heaven. Why? Because we're sinners, heaven's perfect, I'm not perfect, I can't go there. God dwells there, God can't dwell with sin, He's too holy to dwell with sin. He can't even look upon sin. So here is this God in heaven who can't even look upon sin. I'm a sinner. He can't look upon me. God can't dwell with sin. I'm a sinner. He can't dwell with me. I can't dwell in his presence because he's holy. This is a huge problem. We talk about this illustration before, but it's one of the best illustrations I've ever heard. And I usually pick on someone with this illustration. And so if a person is reading this on the internet or hearing it on the internet, you can use yourself in this own illustration. But is there anyone in this room that would consider themselves a real bad swimmer? A bad swimmer. <laughs> pick on Chuck there. I don't think we're going to do that. <laughs> you have a, a problem there. But we'll pick on Art here for tonight. Okay. Art here, let's say Art is a very bad swimmer. You a bad swimmer, Art? Okay, you, you, you sink? Do you sink? Okay, we'll pick on Art. We'll say that Art's a bad swimmer. Now, I think, Chuck, you probably, you probably could swim pretty well with using your arms because you're pretty strong. But let's just say it this way. Art is, is swimming here. The requirements to get to heaven, in this illustration, you have to swim across the Atlantic Ocean. The entire distance across the Atlantic Ocean. You have to leave New York City, and you have to swim to London, England. And so we're going to take two people. We're going to take a good swimmer and a bad swimmer. And we're going to start out with a bad swimmer. And, of course, Art jumps in from the pier in New York City. And he gets like three paddles. And he goes down, blah, 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 Hudson River, whatever. And he drowns. Sharks come and eat Art. <laughs> Art's gone. Now, that was bad. Everyone knows it was bad. Art was bad. Bad swimmer. Bad swimmer, Art. But you have a guy who's a really good swimmer, and I don't know who in this room is a good swimmer. If we pick on Adam here, Adam's a great swimmer. He goes to New York City, he jumps in, and you can tell this guy was born around water. He knows how to swim, and he has powerful strokes, and he just pulls that water, and he kicks, and he's just effortlessly just gliding across, hitting the waves, going through the waves, going over the waves, but without any effort. He just seems to be gliding out there. And, of course, in this situation, when people know that he's trying to get to heaven and he has to swim across the Atlantic to get to heaven, the news media shows up and they start covering this story. The helicopters hover over him and they start announcing he's 10 miles out. He's 15 miles out. And the people start gathering, watching their television sets, looking at this man, this brave man who's out there swimming across the Atlantic Ocean. And he goes out there 40 miles and 50 miles. And, of course, the helicopter is saying he's doing good. He's still strong. He's still swimming strong. And people are cheering on the shore. And then all of a sudden, he drowns. <laughs> 70 miles out. Now, listen, that was great. 
70 miles out, that's a long ways. That's like swimming across the English Channel, no problem. Um, and, and, but he drowned. Sharks eat him. He's dead. Now, we have a good swimmer and a bad swimmer. A real good swimmer and a real bad swimmer. 70 miles and 7 inches. What's the problem? It doesn't matter. They're both dead. I don't care how good Adam was or how bad Art was. The fact is, they're both dead. The wages of sin is death. And you look at the people on this earth. There are good people and there are bad people. The good people, of course, are so wonderful. They're able to do almost anything. People look at them and they're so impressed with these good, good people. But it doesn't matter because if the wages of sin is death and we're all sinners, it doesn't matter whether you're good or bad. You have fallen short of the glory of God. You will die. And every good person and every bad person will end up in hell. Every good person and every bad person will end up in hell because before God, there is none righteous, there is none good, no, not one. I'm telling you, people in this world don't comprehend this. Religion says that you're good enough. There's good in everybody, and God is going to let everyone in because you're all good. But it's just not true. They don't understand God's holiness. The fourth principle is you cannot become righteous by your good works. No matter how good you are, no matter how good you are, you cannot be saved by your good works. The good works will not, will not allow you to get into heaven. Now, you have here a report card, and for most of us, this report card is identical to the report card you had in fifth grade. It's identical. I can just picture that. Can't you picture that? That's your report card in fifth grade, and... and um, a C in mathematics. <laughs> just gives you the chills just looking at it. <laughs> You've got to bring that card home to your mom and dad and show them that report card. <clears throat> and you do not want to get a C in physical education. You do not want to. Not when you have three brothers. You just do not want that to happen. So it's not a good report card. You don't want that to, to come home to your mom and dad, especially if they give you a dollar for every A. Not the greatest report card. But most people in this world really do believe that God grades on a curve. They really believe that if your good outweighs your bad, if somehow you're a little better than your bad, God is such a loving God that he will take you to himself and he will hold you so tight and he says, you come into my kingdom. Because I understand that you're really good by nature. That's not true. It's not true. We are not here to compare ourselves with other people. If we could compare ourselves with other people, you would never know if you are good enough to go to heaven because you do not know what the cutoff is. If this person has a 3.0 grade point average and the cutoff is 3.2, he is going to go to hell. You do not know what the cutoff is. If God grades on the curve, how good do you have to be? Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, how good do you have to be? According to the Bible, you have to be as good as God. You have to be as righteous as God. And there is no one in this world, no one on this earth, that's good enough to get to heaven because God does not grade on the curve. You would have to have A plus 100%. You'd have to be better than Ivory Snow because Ivory Snow is only 99 and 99 one hundredth percent pure. And if you're 99 and 99 one hundredth percent pure, you're not pure. There's no such thing as 99 and 99 one hundredth percent pure. There's two righteousnesses in the Bible, of course. The Bible speaks about two righteousnesses, man's and God's. And I want you to understand that the majority of religions in this world, I'll say that again, I think all religions in this world teach man's righteousness to get to heaven. I think there's a huge difference between religion and Christianity. I think religion teaches that man, by his efforts, is going to please God, and it's just not going to happen. Most religions, the religions that you study, the religions you know about, teach that mankind, if he works hard enough, his righteousness will be good enough for God to allow him to get into heaven. But the Bible teaches you must have the righteousness of God to get to heaven. And people, that is really difficult for people to understand. You have to be as righteous as God is. 
How many people do you know who are as righteous as God? That's what the Bible teaches. Let me say this, though, before we go on. This is a huge problem before God, the deity, the God who created this world. It's a huge problem. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. But as long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. God wants all men to be saved. 1 Peter chapter 2 says, Who will have all men to be saved, verse 4, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants all men to be saved. Friends, this problem here that I'm talking about here is the greatest problem that's ever occurred on, in the universe. It's greater than any problem you've ever faced. This is a problem of such magnitude because it pits the attribute of God against the attribute of God. God's eternal attribute against God's eternal attribute, they are opposed, totally opposed, 180 degrees opposed to each other. The two attributes of God that are, that are opposed to each other is, number one, God loves man. God is merciful. God is gracious. God wants man to be saved because God loves man. And God's righteousness, his holiness. The love of God demands that the sinner is saved. The holiness demands that the sinner dies. These two attributes are in such opposition to each other in the mind of God. And the Romans chapter 3 says, how can God be just and at the same time justify the sinner? How can God be just and still justify the sinner? His righteousness does not allow God to just wink and say you're forgiven. He doesn't allow that. So God has to come up with a way, and of course he came up with a way. Principle number five, the solution to this great problem, the solution to the problem is God sent his son to pay for every single sin we've committed. And again, you've seen the illustration. This is again something that I want everyone to notice. This wallet here representing sin, this hand representing you and I, the Bible says all of us have sin on us. I used to think God, God hated me because I was a sinner. But that's not true, God loves me but he hates that sin because the sin separates me from God. God created me to have fellowship with him. But that sin is an issue because it separates me from God. God and I cannot have fellowship because of our sin. God is too holy to approach unto a sinner. If this hand represents God, the Bible says this, For he, God, hath made him Christ to be sin for us. Jesus Christ was not a sinner. He became sin for us. The Bible says, Who knew no sin... Jesus Christ didn't know any sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ took that sin upon himself. He died upon the cross. He was buried and rose up again without sin unto salvation so that we could have eternal life. Now again, the religion of this world says that if you can just get rid of sin, if you can get rid of some of the sin, you can't get rid of all the sin. No matter how much sin you get rid of, you still have sin on you. You not only committed sin yesterday, but you'll commit sin today. You'll get, commit sin tomorrow. You'll commit sin your entire life. The Bible says we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and his word is not in us. But listen again, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If you have, notice those words, if you have the righteousness of God, how righteous are you? We're not talking about man's righteousness. It says you can have the righteousness of God in him. That means you can become perfect in God's sight, holy in God's sight, totally without sin. This is the answer to the dilemma. How can God be just and at the same time be justified? You've heard me share with you this illustration of the hanging judge. But again, it's the best illustration I've ever heard on the subject. The judge is on the, the bench and the judge is a mean judge <laughs> to the people because he always pronounces the most strict penalty the law can possibly have him 
him pronounce a man comes before him he slams down the gavel 90 days in jail $500 fine and the people wow that guy he's always the very limit to what he can p- pronounce against people he's always there he's never gracious he's never merciful but one day this judge is sitting on the throne and a guard brings his own son into the courtroom if this could happen the son comes up the, the, the aisle and it is the state of Minnesota against John Doe, the son of the judge, Judge Doe. And this man comes up before the, and the judge looks at him. Matt, what do you do? Or John, what did you do? And he says, well, Dad, I was caught speeding. I was caught reckless driving. I ran over two cats and a dog, chased a lady off the street and wrecked your car. <laughs> and the judge is sitting here. How do you plead? And he says, guilty. He slams down the gavel. Now you can ma- imagine this. All the people in the courtroom are all snickering. The bailiff is snickering. Watch, you'll let a son off. I can promise you, you'll let a son off. He slams down the gavel and he says, 90 days in jail, $500 fine, and the mouths just drop open. You gotta be kidding. His own son. You gotta be kidding me. And then this judge stands up and he takes off his robes and he lays the robe over the back of the chair of the judgment seat and he walks down and he takes out his wallet and he writes a check for $500 and gives it to the clerk. Now, if he could, he would spend the 90 days in jail for his son because justice has to be served. He pronounces the penalty, the soul that sins, it must die. And then God himself takes off his robes. That's who Jesus Christ was. He was God without the robes on. He was God who took off his robes, came to this earth, died upon the cross for the sins of mankind, every single sin, every sin, so that mankind could be forgiven, so that mankind could know that they were saved. 1 Peter 2.24, it's a word I like to use, the word substitutionary atonement, that he was our substitute, he died in our place, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes, Jesus Christ's stripes, were healed. Principle six. Six principle is a very important principle. Even though Jesus Christ died on the cross for every single sin, every one sin, it does not mean you are saved. It does not mean you're saved. It does not automatically mean you're saved. God is not going to force that upon anyone. His love demands you have a choice. And God allows you that choice of either accepting it or rejecting it. And the Bible is very clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son hath not life but the wrath of God abides on him. John 3.36 If you do not have the son of God you do not have life and you will, John 3, 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. You're already condemned because you do not believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, this is very vital to Christianity because there's a lot of people out there saying, you believe in easy believism. You believe that all you have to do is, is believe in Christ. I want you to understand this. This is so important to Christianity. There are two Greek words here, and I have them on the board. You can look at the very first letter in the Greek is the word pi. You get it in math, mathematics, especially in algebra or geometry, especially in geometry, pi r squared or whatever. The word pi or the P symbol, that is P in English or P in Greek, the pi. Then you have the, the iota, the sigma, the tau. Um, you got that root word. Pi, iota, sigma, tau is the same exact root word in the first word and the second word. The only difference between these two words, the only difference between these two words is one of them is a verb and one of them is a noun. 
When you have the omega ending, that's that W kind of looking thing, the omega ending, which is a long O sound, pistuo, that long O ending is the word I. And it makes into a verb, and it means I believe. The word pistuo means I believe. But if you look at the root, it's the exact same root, and that pi iota sigma tau means faith, if it's a noun. If it's a noun, it means faith. If it's a verb, it's I believe. Now, when God says, he whoever believes in me would not perish, yeah, the devil believes. But you have to understand, the word does not mean that I believe in George Washington. I believe in some facts. The word means, do you have faith in, or do you trust in, do you depend upon, because the word means faith. The word belief in the Bible is not, do you believe in George Washington, but do you believe in your son? Pastor Lapine, you let your son take out that car at 2 o'clock in the morning and drive around? Yes. Why? Because I believe in him. I trust him. I have total trust in him. I don't have any worry about what he's going to do at night because I trust him. I believe in him. That's what the word means in the Greek. The devil does not put his trust in Jesus Christ as his Savior. I put my trust in Jesus Christ. I do not put my trust in my good works. I do not put my trust in my baptism. I do not put my trust in my confirmation. None of those things can save you. My trust is in the only way to heaven. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And there's nothing you can add to that. Because if you add anything to it, then you're trusting in something other than Jesus Christ. It can only be Christ. It can only be Christ alone because that's the only way you can have the righteousness of God given to you. You must place your faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. You cannot be saved by your works. It's not partly by Christ, partly by your goodness that will not save you. It's Christ alone because your trust, your faith must be in him and him alone. See, that's what gets people, when it comes to trying to get to heaven, they try so hard, they believe in Christ, but they try so hard to save themselves. And every time they try, they fail. They try, they fail. They try, they fail. I remember as a little boy, my grandma used to tell me about heaven, and I wanted to go there. But I had these nightmares. And this nightmare, I was in the, the cabin, and the whole roof of the building opened up, and Jesus Christ was coming back. And my grandfather fell on the floor, and he screamed out, We're not ready! We're not ready! I think we were watching a baseball game, and that pretty much did us in there. But I fell on the floor of my bed that night, and I said, Lord, if you'll give me another chance, and I'm just trembling, I'll do a better job. I'll live a better life. Problem is, I couldn't do it. Three, four months later, I had another nightmare that Jesus Christ came back and I fell on the bed again and I said, Lord, help me. I can't do this. I need to live a better life. I can't live a better life. Until I finally understood that that's not what salvation is about. It's not about me. It's about what Jesus Christ did on the cross. But he won't force me to accept that. He gave me that opportunity to put my trust in him or reject him and I received that free gift. The Bible says, but to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Quick illustration, what is a savior? Another real good illustration that I like to use and I'd like to have you know about it, what is a savior? You're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I hope we're not in this thing trying to drive or swim across the Atlantic Ocean again, but you're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and you're floundering. You're really floundering and you're having a hard time swimming out there and you're just floundering and you've already gone down twice. I think you can only go down three before you're down. I don't know, but you've already gone down twice and the speedboat comes motoring up to you and this guy says, are you okay? No, I'm drowning. Do you need help? Yeah, I need help. And the guy takes out of his library a book. Ten easy steps to be a marathon swimmer, and he throws it to you. Read that quick. And so you try to page through it and paddle as hard as you can and kick as hard as you can. And while he does it, he takes out the chalkboard and he diagrams. This is what you got to do. This is what you got to do. Listen, you're going to drown if you don't do this. <laughs> a lot of people think Jesus Christ came to this earth to be a teacher, to teach us how to live. That's not a savior. 
A savior is not one to teach you how to swim. He takes off. The next boat comes up. And this boat, he's, you're, you're still floundering here, and this boat says, Are you okay? No, I'm drowning. Do you need help? Yeah. The guy jumps in. And he gets alongside. He goes, Do this. Now, this looks weird on the internet, I'm sure. But you're doing the side stroke here. Do this, you know. And he starts doing a side stroke around you in circles to teach you how to swim. Gets back in the boat, takes off. Is he a savior? No, he's a way shower, and there's a lot of people that think Jesus Christ came to show us how to live. He's the way shower. There's a song years ago, he came to teach us how a man should live. And that's just not true. That's at least not when it comes to getting to heaven. Jesus Christ is not a way shower. The next person comes up in a speedboat. You need help? Yeah, I'm drowning. This guy jumps in. He grabs you, pulls you in the boat. He goes three, four miles, and he says, I don't like you after all. Throws you back in. Is he a savior? No, he's a probation officer. Now, listen to me carefully. There's a lot of people, a lot of churches out there that think you're saved until you sin again. As soon as you sin, God throws you back in again. Is that a savior? You understand the definition of a savior? The guy comes up, he pulls you in the boat, he drives you off, brings you all the way to shore, maybe gives you something to eat, and drops you off in a place where you're safe. And when you're safe, that's a definition of a savior. And when God says he is able to save to the uttermost, those that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them, this is a savior. He's able to save to the uttermost. He brings you right to the shore of heaven. Jesus Christ is the way. He is the eternal life. And the only way you can be saved is putting your trust in him. And of course, principle number seven, these things are written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. We started with that verse, and the Bible says you can know it. You say, but pastor, I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe. I don't feel saved or safe. Now let me go to this one first. This is a good looking bank. It's brick. It's got windows. This is a bank somewhere. It's got a teller. It's pretty cool. But let's go back to the first bank. <laughs> How would you like to have your money in that bank? I think Jesse James robbed that bank a few times. So this is actually a bank, but it's a historic bank. But you can imagine, you put your money in this bank, and then all night long, you're just, oh, my money's not safe. If you see that bank, oh, that bank would... It couldn't save anything. And you're just worried all night long about this money. You are so worried about your money. The next morning, you come to draw your money out of the bank, and the bank president comes to you and says, what are you doing? Well, I'm taking the money out of your bank. I don't trust your bank. And he says, he says now let me show you some things. He goes and shows you this vault. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. It senses sensors on this vault that could... Can, it can actually sense when a fly is walking on the door. It's so sensitive. It's got these, these foolproof locking mechanisms. It's got these alarms. It's got all kinds of stuff. Maybe, maybe electrocution device if someone <laughs> tries to open it without the proper code. Who knows? Once you see it, you say, ah, my money is safe. My point being this, what made your money safe? Was it your faith? Or was it the object of your faith? There's many doubts in your life after you're a Christian. But what saves your money is you, did you put it in the bank? Because once it's in the bank, it's safe. This is a secure bank. It may not look it to you, but it is secure. But of course, Jesus Christ is not only does he is secure, but he looks secure. But just because you have doubts doesn't mean your money's not safe. Did you put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Your faith does not save you. You can have all the faith in the world in a chair. You can have the faith in your, in your car to get you to heaven. Your faith doesn't save you. It's the object of faith. Have you put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Because He is the Savior. For He shall save His people from their sins. Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men especially of those that believe. If you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. You don't have to doubt it. You don't have to worry. You don't have to wonder. And how do I know I'm safe? Because God promised it to me in the Bible, and my God does not lie. He does not lie. He will never lie. And if you're watching this on the Internet, 
I want to ask you, have you ever put your just trust in Jesus Christ? You can ask him to save you right now. If you're wondering about it, the Bible is very clear that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. But God loved you that much that he died for you. Would you accept him as your Savior? Would you put your trust in him? It's not by your works. It's a free gift. It's not by your baptism, not by your church membership or your church attendance. It's by receiving what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. Once you're saved, God gives you a gift of the Holy Spirit. And once the Holy Spirit comes within you, then that gives you totally different desires. It gives you power to do things you could not do before you were saved. And God asks you to do some things not to be saved, but because you are saved. But none of those things save you. Salvation must be, it can only be a free gift. Have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior? Friends, we're going to close in a word of prayer right now. Thank you. Father, thank you very much for this day and just ask your blessing upon our church. Thank you very much for this how-to series and I pray, Father, that this would be very clear to the people in our church, that we would understand what you've done for us, but also, Lord, that we would know how to say it to people so that they could understand and they could know without any doubt that they are, are saved and their sins are forgiven. And again, we ask, Lord, that you might be glorified in the things that we've said and done tonight and that this might be used for your glory and on our website to be your will. In your name we pray. Amen. You see, the Bible makes it very clear that we have to be perfect to get to heaven. And no matter how many good things you do, you can never become perfect. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth and he died upon the cross to pay for your sin. When he took your sin, he also gave you his righteousness. The Bible says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's why the Bible also says, For God made him Christ to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, this would be a great time for you to put your trust in Christ by receiving his free gift, by putting your trust in him, the one who died on the cross for you. If there's anything we can do to help you, please give us a call. We'd love to help you come to know Christ to know him better and also make him known to others. You know, if you love Christ, you also love his body. And of course, his body is the church. And so if you don't have a church that you attend, we invite you to come and visit us at Calvary Baptist Church this week. Our service times are 9.30 and 10.30 for our worship service and Sunday night at 6 o'clock. We'd enjoy seeing you this Sunday.